Three laws of writing readable code. Okay. First, second, and third. Let's see. Maybe he has some really good teachings for us. Let's see. One of the main giveaways of an inexperienced developer is deeply necessary Deep. code. <laughs> wrong! It's so wrong already. It is so wrong already. That is not how it is. Absolutely not. Wrong. He's already wrong. He's already wrong. Next video. Yeah. Totally not true. Absolutely not true. That has nothing to do with inexperience. Absolutely not. Well, you can do the early return. You can do that. But sometimes you can't because you want to have another else. You you can do that. Fine. Logic but like this. It's wrong. This is difficult to reason about because as you're reading through each subsequent level, you're needing to hold in your mind the condition that yeah, allows us true. to traverse deeper into the That's difficult structure. to read. By the you time you get to the core logic, return, yeah. your brain is likely pushing the limits of its capacity, but you still need to understand the core logic while taking into consideration the things that you're already holding in your mind. For this reason, the first law of writing readable code is to avoid deep nesting. We can simplify this code by first making use of inversion. That is, we invert the conditionals. Yeah, your early return so essentially. Instead of doing this inner logic only if it is not a maintenance period and doing the else logic if we can't You do can't the inner always logic, return though. Yes, sometimes that works, but not always. We can simply say that if it is in fact a maintenance period, then we it's good don't for move on to the next yeah. step. As you can see, that collapses the nested structure one level. We can do the same with the other conditionals. Yeah, we oh god, this animation. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's called early return. Now, you should probably return your code here. will find that they are no longer needing to hold these conditions in their head while reading the. But you, if you have a fatal, then you should return, bro. Like you can't just continue on a fatal. Um, I logic. hope he returns they simply you. know that if the code has executed beyond a certain point, this point, for example, he needs then to the return. previous code no longer needs to be taken into consideration. They can discard it from their mind and focus on the next code block. Another technique that we can incorporate is we can... Okay, let's just pretend this is just for the example, but you need to return here. Like, if you don't return and just continue doing your program, you're still gonna crash. Fatal probably raises an exception. I see, so Fatal resists. Yeah, he still needs to return though. I guess he doesn't, but yeah. Merge related if statements. For example, checking if the user is authenticated and checking if the user is authorized are both validations related to auth. So we can actually merge these two, keeping in mind that you lose some granularity here with the log method. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Now that our it depends if you really want to separate these two code is starting to look more readable, we can make use of another technique called extraction. That is, we'll extract some of the complex logic to its own methods or functions. Why? This is what I find stupid. This is the most common advice that everyone gives, which I think is the worst advice ever. Now, what you have here right now. And like, listen, listen, I can totally get it that reading a bunch of functions is easier. However, however, if you write your code in a way that is easy to read, like from top to bottom, then extracting these into functions, if you don't need them in other places, just makes it so that whenever you come back, you have to jump into the function, losing your overall overview of the entire function and it can be more difficult to track what's going on if you want to have separation here then you can create local scopes and name those local scopes that is what worked very well for me because you cannot if you don't believe me that's fine like okay yeah, cake's a noob i get it cake's an idiot i i get it too fine if you don't believe me believe the words of john carmack john carmack on inline code in the years since I wrote this, I've gotten much more bullshit about pre-functional programming, pure functional programming, even in C++, C, where reasonable. Sometimes the elegant implementation is just a function, not a method, not a class, not a framework, just a function. There it is. This must be, this is from John Carmack, right? So basically this, this right here, I'm gonna link that. 
Use a using large comment blocks inside the major function to delimit the minor functions is a good idea for quick scanning. So basically what he's saying here is scopes. And for example, I have one in... What is that? Diabloba. So for example, right here, I have a scope that basically says, well, this function draws me the Diablo bar in my game. Why is it comment better than just calling a draw Diablo bar? Well, that's a valid question. So essentially, the Diablo bar that I'm talking about is this bar right here at the bottom. That's the Diablo bar in my game. And to the right here, if I deselect this guy, this is the list of heroes. Currently, this is a new save, so there's only one hero. However, the important part here is that this, this Diablo bar is only needs to be drawn in one place in the game. And right here. This function name is really bad, but basically it's like display everything that needs to be displayed when you select a hero. And so there's no need to create a function because it is not needed in any other place. And basically this is what John Carmack and other developers too, but you know, let's use him as an example, agree with. Often enclosing it in a bare braced section to scope the local variables and, and allow editor collapsing of the section is useful. I know there are some rules of thumb about not making functions longer than a page or two, but I specifically disagree with that now. If a lot of operations are supposed to happen in a sequential fashion, their code should flow sequentially. Now why is that true? Why is that? Why did he come to this conclusion? And I came to this too. I was the same with functions. Well, because it makes it easier to read from top to bottom. You can just read the entire thing. You know exactly what is supposed to happen at each moment in your code. If you have a bunch of functions that go everywhere, you can't keep track of that very much. So like, that's why I don't agree with this, because if this is supposed to flow here, you're just ripping this apart and making it more difficult to follow. And you can call these from outside, from anywhere else in the code. And maybe you're not supposed to do that. Starting with this slightly confusing if statement. At a glance, it's a little bit difficult for a reader to quickly determine what this condition is for. And good coders are... Then you have to change how it's... Then you have to just change how the variables are named. User is authenticated. Like, it, But it is... It's not confusing at all. What? Keeping in mind the experience of whoever might need to read their code. So let's extract this complex. Well, authenticated and authorized. Well, yeah, but logic sense, into its no. own function and give it a descriptive name. Note that in the function, we're returning whether or not both conditions are true. <coughs> and in the if statement, we check if the user is valid as determined by the logic in the function. That is, in my opinion, that's also dangerous because now you don't know what valid means. What does valid mean? Now, while obviously you can go into the function and search for this, but what if you just want the user to be authenticated but not authorized? Then you have to create another function. And then the function is called is user authenticated. That just this does this doesn't make any sense. It's so stupid. Like, sorry, sorry. This 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 is not this is not the solution. Absolutely not. Like if, because most cases, like the reason why I'm saying this is because yeah, okay, well, maybe this in his special case, he always wants to check those two. Then this function could potentially make sense. But if we are talking about authentication and authorization, oftentimes you want to distinguish the two, right? Because you could be authenticated, but you could not be authorized. There could be some stuff hidden be behind an authentication, which is basically a login, right? But it could also be hidden be behind an authorization, admin privileges, normal user privileges. And so, I'm sorry, but this is a really bad example. Yeah. So, Lastly, on top of not we can extract this, this function, entire really. switch statement here into its own function. Now, what we've done. Calculate taxes. Here is we've made it so that the reader of our code can get a summary of the overall functionality by just glancing at the main function. That is, the reader can now easily see that this code simply calculates the taxes. No, he doesn't know what valid user means. He doesn't know how the, the taxes are calculated. Well, he might not need to know that. Of the user's shopping cart if it's not a maintenance period and if the user is an authorized user. But that very simple top level functionality was difficult to determine or understand when the code. 
Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You create a local scope and say that this calculates taxes. And then you know exactly how the taxes are calculated. If this is the only place where you need to calculate the taxes, then it should be here. Code looked like this. The second law of writing readable code has to do with the way you organize your code. Mm -hmm. We're presented with okay. two functions here, both. It gets user function. No, uh, it's difficult to read. Belonging to the same program. All uh, I see. Uh, well, now he's going to go into the single letter variables, which is bad. We have a, a W and an E. This should be a request or HTTP request. And what is it? The readable? Writable? Read? Writable? Although with response these... writer. Yeah, response writer. Um, <clears throat> they both have the same. Are doing get like... user. Okay, get users. Well, single letter variables. That's what I think is bad. And then DB, I guess DB could be a database. It's usually database. And then user U. Yeah. Va user U user. Be pretty straightforward. The issues lock on, lock, start dot, to dot. reveal themselves when you consider the case where the reader of your code needs to make changes. For example, mm -hmm. let's imagine that the reader of your code is tasked with removing the caching behavior from the application. Okay. Since the same caching behavior is found in multiple locations throughout the application, the reader of your code is going to need to search everywhere, potentially missing spots where this behavior might exist. This is a direct result of this application having lots of code duplication. For this reason and many others, the second... I mean, yeah, you do have code duplication here. However, between the lock and unlock, you have these... Well, you don't. You have this code, which is the same as this code, and this code is the same as this code. While, yes, this is bad, if it doesn't happen too much, it's actually not that bad. The law of cash writing find readable cash code add. is to avoid code duplication. We can extract this logic into its own function to be called by both of the parent functions. While we're at it, let's go ahead and extract this duplicated code for writing the response to the client as well. Get single user, get users. I mean, write response is something that you would create a function for, for sure. Because write response is something that happens a lot. Now, what is W though? Like, maybe he goes into this. We only need to make changes to the single shared point. This also makes the code less convoluted, in turn making it more readable. The final law. It's gonna be the variable names, right? Here we have an example of some code. What this code does is anybody's guess. Yeah, well, if you put a question marks the second you show the code, then yes. Yeah, it's the variable names. Yeah, of course. It's the this variable code names. has committed the ultimate sin, which brings me to the third and final law Looks of like writing Scott, you're wrong. code. Don't use naming that only you understand. Now, there are a lot of different naming conventions out there, but to be honest, as long as you're trying to follow some naming convention and keeping <laughs> in mind that the code. names you use should be meaningful to potential readers of your code, you will unfortunately be doing better than a lot of people out there. You'll see that if we... Wait, he could have like shown an example of how to rename the code properly. Why is he not doing that? I guess he got lazy simply revise this code a bit to have some more meaningful names it becomes clear what this code is actually trying to do and it's as simple as that so oh, oh i see where the, the videos are oh, i see the videos are blocking the view that's kind of that's kind of annoying um yeah products tax product yeah of course you would like but this i think this one is obvious right what the most what most people do is not call a struct p but they call variable names inside loop, inside loops, single letters, like I, K, J, right? These variable names. Oftentimes they can be very difficult to determine what you are actually iterating over. If you have an iteration going over, let's say, do I have an iteration here? Somewhere? Yeah, so for example here, I have abilities on, on heroes and then I have slots that uh, the abilities fit into. And so I'm iterating over the slots. So I know exactly that this index is talking about a slot. You can also do ranged based for loops for the win, of course, right? There you have it. The three laws of writing readable code. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to leave a like and I'll see you in the next one. See ya. See ya. See ya. I know this is an, this is an unpopular opinion, but unfortunately, these are the optimizations that everyone is talking about and everyone is agreeing with. 
But the more you program, the more you realize that this is actually really, diffi really difficult to keep following. It's dogma. Yeah, unfortunately it is. A dogma doesn't change. And again, let John Carmack teach you. Uh, if you don't believe me, that's fine. You know, you can. T I could totally understand. I haven't released any game yet. But let John Carmack, Carmack teach you with this right here. Try to read this. And try to understand what he's trying to say. Coding for 16 years professionally for 8 years, AAA games for almost 4. My take is that this is bullshit. Thank you, Code and Gree. I appreciate it, you know.